Kardin Sheila. Thank you very much, uh, Kent and Lunch and Jigme. Welcome to Toronto. Welcome back to Canada. Kuzuzambo. It's a great pleasure to see you here. I, I, I have to start with a declaration of interest, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am interviewing my former boss. <laughs> uh, he, I think you were actually my boss's boss's boss. <laughs> uh, but I worked in the Department of Education in, uh, in Bhutan at Shorbzi College from 1985 to 1987. And uh, Dasho Jigmit as he then was known, was Director of Education at the time. So good to see you again. Great to meet you again. Can I start by asking you how you might uh, situate gross national happiness in a much broader tradition? Uh, we, you know, if you, even if you go back to the 1940s and 1950s, uh, some of the great economists uh, who thought about growth, Simon Kuznets, who invented GN GNP, uh, Arthur Lewis, were very clear that growth doesn't bring happiness. Uh, and that led in the 60s and 70s to a whole series of um, thoughts about development uh, as something broader than national income. Uh, we talked about basic needs. Uh, in 1969, Dudley Sears asked, what are we trying to measure? What's the meaning of development? Uh, and then that ended up in the, uh, the UNDP's Human Development Index from 1990 onwards. So what does gross national happiness add to this already rich tradition of thought about non-money metrics of development? Thank you. <clears throat> It is a pleasure to, to meet you. Uh, I'm sorry you lost some hair. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty years have, of wear and tear. We were both very young people then. <laughs> yes, um, the sad thing is that uh, people didn't listen. Simon Kuznets himself appealed to the Congress and uh, advised them of the limitations of his indicator. But nobody listened. Not the Congress, not the United Nations, not the World Bank. And then others raised voices that were never really heard. I am amazed that uh, my friend Lachlan has been able to dig up some of these voices of the past. But I must tell you very frankly, I had not heard them. In fact, until recently, happiness was something that the world did not want to speak of. Politicians did not want to touch it for fear that they may not be taken seriously. Academics had to be content in the margins of the academia if they did dare to touch it. So um, the broader audience the larger world did not hear them. But what we have done is pursue this seriously. Having adopted happiness as an attainable goal, as an imperative, we have pursued this for over 40 years, as I mentioned. And I think the world is now convinced that if we want to go further ahead, if we want to grow, not only economically, but socially, ecologically, in every other sense, spirituality. We need a multi-dimensional approach in a holistic way, which is what GDP, GNH does. It's a holistic, multi-dimensional, and inclusive approach to pursuing growth. I'm glad you used the word uh, spiritual in there because um, outside of departments of theology, uh, it's a word we don't often use in higher education, uh, especially not in, in units of development studies. So perhaps you could tell us a bit about uh, to what extent um, the spiritual values of Bhutanese Buddhism animate uh, gross national happiness. One of the pillars talks about uh, the preservation of the national culture. Um, so, can you tell us about uh, that uh, specifically Buddhist and spiritual side of, of GNH? I think one of the reasons why we dared to um, adopt this ideal state as a national goal had to do with our 
Buddhist culture, Buddhist ethos. Because uh, Buddhism believes, rather democratically, that every human being is capable of attaining the highest level in terms of highest level of growth, highest level of development, human development, which is happiness. Um, and so uh, uh, the g &H model, in a sense, is uh, uh, founded on this idea of a country and of a population that will be able to achieve this highest, this highest human value, as opposed to uh, other cultures that were fearful of touching this value. And, 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 uh, and also it calls for uh, you know, uh, basic human observation and pursuance of basic human values, such as compassion, altruism, and so on. Um, and also control of greed, which we believe is what GNH uses to promote this consumerist ethics. So because of these, I think uh, we were able to conceive this. But at the same time, I must say that GNH, as I said earlier, is not Buddhist. It's not a Buddhist uh, in a paradigm. It is not something that is only relevant to a Buddhist society. It is relevant to any section, any country, any section of human society, any country. Uh, one, it's one thing to declare uh, GNH or any other high-level goal as a priority. I mean, we've had countries declare socialism as their priority or uh, sustainable development. Um, it's one thing to make that declaration. It's quite another thing to carry it out in practice. So can you tell us a bit about some of the administrative and management challenges that you've had as a senior government official mm. in actually implementing something as, as broad and philosophical as gross national happiness? Well, a simple answer to that is, um, as I mentioned in my uh, statement earlier, it was after deep and extensive consultations with the people that the king decided on adopting JNH as a development model. <clears throat> and the king, so it was the desire of the people. You know, it was the collective, the popular aspiration of the Buddhist people who at that time, as I mentioned earlier, were very simple and very spiritual. You know, it is the poor people that are spiritual. And as they get richer, they become greedy. And, they, bec and uh, they you know, um, well. Can, can, so, maybe you can give us a, an example of, of you so, talked about GNH yeah. positive and GNH negative policies. Yeah. In the, in well, the, before I go on to that, what I wanted to say is that, uh, so it was something that the people themselves wanted, but more than that, it was something a very popular monarch, revered by the people, had decided was what we should do. And so it had this support, this tremendous support, uh, this, uh, you know, it had the backing of somebody that nobody wanted to deny, nobody would, would object to, uh, and most willingly abide by. Mm. So, uh, uh, there were no difficulties that uh, the policymakers or the civil servants faced in implementing, to begin with, in those days, the four uh, pillars of development, four pillars of gross national happiness. But you, you said uh, the, the Planning Commission has now been transformed into the Gross National Happiness Commission. It's chaired by the Prime Minister, and its job is to make sure that um, all policies are GNH cleared. You use the words GNH positive and avoid GNH negative. Can you can you give us a concrete example, maybe, of of, of uh, one policy or one decision you had to make while you were prime minister? 
Well, there were so many. And, um, you know, as uh, a former head of government, and then again uh, as the head of government of the first democratically elected government, um, and in a country where democracy is in an emerging state, uh, I have felt that uh, I, as a former prime minister, need to stay away from uh, being associated with any kind of policy statements. Um, and so I will not mention any uh, specific case, but uh, uh, this process is something that my government actually uh, initiated and introduced. And all government policies proposed from any section of the government, any ministry, any department, any agency, has to first go to the Gross National Happiness Commission, which has this screening tool whereby every policy is vetted against the some 124 variables, or at least the 33 indicators. And those that prove, those that have uh, elements that could have externalities of the kind that are opposed to uh, GNH values, will have to have them removed or risk being rejected by the commission, which in turn will ensure that it never reaches the cabinet. Mm -hmm. And in, in the last 30 years, um, you know better than I, Bhutan has become a country with uh, a vibrant civil society, a vibrant private sector, how do you bring them on board with GNH? Well, again, as I said, for one, because GNH is something that was personally promoted by a popular king, by a revered king. It is something that is enthusiastically you know, accepted and pursued uh, demonstratively by all so-called leaders and opinion lead makers in the country, mm. both in the private sector as well as within the civil society. So, um, and at the same time, with respect to the civil society, there is the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And with respect to the business sector, there is the Ministry of Trade and Industries that are bound, that are required to ensure that those agencies and those activities, programs that, come, that fall under them are monitored closely and ensured that uh, they perform, they act, and uh, they uh, conduct themselves within the GNH framework. Okay, and the other actor, of course, in, in uh, a lot of developing countries is uh, the donors. Um, how are the donors on GNH? And uh, I know from having been both uh, a member of the Royal Bhutanese Civil Service, but also having been on the other side of the table as a UN official, uh, I know that the agendas of host governments and, and donors don't always jive 100%. Um, how have you, uh, how, what, what has been Bhutan's experience in uh, promoting GNH with uh, the donors who provide assistance to Bhutan? Both well, uh, there has been no conflict at all. Uh, although initially, I remember in fact, once I was associated, I was involved with a World Bank project the very first World Bank project in Bhutan, and that was in the education sector, and I was the education director. I'd just taken over then. And uh, the World Bank team was led by a very arrogant person from, one, from a Western country. And uh, he and his uh, colleagues that, that was the high were convinced Americans. that their role was to uh, guide this ignorant country through a process of redesigning the education system in the way they felt most appropriate and most beneficial for a country like Bhutan. We didn't agree. And finally, we reached a moment when uh, the World Bank team stood up, got up, picked up their briefcases and said, if this is what the, the position that you insist on, Mr. Thinle, we are pack packing our bags and leaving. And I told them to please leave. <laughs> because 
If you think you are here to do something for yourselves, there is no room for you here in this country. We have asked you to come here to help us achieve our dreams, our aspirations, our goals, our policies, not yours. They left. They left. And that was the first project, and we needed that money very badly. It was $7 million, huge amount for Bhutan. And there was in the, among you know, the, uh, the, uh, the World Bank delegation a Swiss gentleman. And the Swiss were co-financing. They had come up with $5 million, and the, American, uh, the uh, US had come up with, uh, sorry, the World Bank with $2 million. So the large amount came from the Swiss. And the Swiss professor st stayed back momentarily and said, keep it up. This is we do. <laughs> <laughs> he came back the next day. But things like that have not been frequent. And more recently, I have to, uh, you know, uh, at the sound of, you know, at the risk of sounding immodest, Bhutan is one of those countries that promoted, that mooted this idea of, uh, uh, you know, uh, national control being in the driver's seat with respect to development assistance. And, uh, and uh, uh, the other good thing is that our goals, our values, the kind of values that we wanted to promote through the programs that were being financed or that are being financed by overseas uh, partners are very much consistent with the same values that they want to promote, like human rights, democracy, education, health, better infrastructure, reduction of poverty, and being at this initial stage of development, at this, you know, uh, this low stage of development, almost every program that we propose is very much consistent with the policies that, under which the donors want to uh, give us their money. So if I can switch gears and become a professor again and tell the students uh, in the room, um, there's actually an important lesson here that not all donors are the same and that a smart host government can play one against the other <laughs> and, and still get what it wants. Um, there, there have been enormous changes, social and economic, in Bhutan in the last 40, 50 years. Um, and uh, the GDP per capita is now, I think, three or four times higher than what it was uh, when I worked in your country. Um, but with it has come uh, changing, uh, changing social patterns. Uh, there's a lot more um, conspicuous consumption in Bhutan. Um, the internet and television reached Bhutan over 15 years ago. How might this globalization and the, the, and the import of, of outside values, especially consumption-based values, uh, affect uh, uh, things in Bhutan? How, how does that affect uh, the government's pursuit of gross national Well, it happiness? is something that worries us. And there were those um, who wonder whether it was a mistake for us to have opened Bhutan to internet and to television. But uh, I have always maintained that this was never a mistake. Bhutan is part of the globalizing world. And whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, external influence will always be there. Our people will be exposed to these influences. The culture of consumerism is something that uh, we cannot shut our people from being exposed to. What we hope is that, firstly, when we introduced, um, you know, uh, when we opened, Bhutan to the outside world. We did so at a stage when we felt that we were ready. That, uh, you know, it was at a time when um, Bhutanese had an adequate sense of pride about their own culture. And this is something, sorry, am I, am I exceeding time? Uh, well, you know, we, we were quite strongly well grounded in our values, quite unlike many developing countries that had embarked on development before us, who began their development process with a sense of shame about their own identity and own culture. We felt that 
we were able, we had been able to you know, develop and create this pride that uh, the Bhutanese were strong enough to be exposed to this, to, to, the, to, the, to the outside world. And having done so, I cannot say that uh, it, there has been any reason for us to regret. Yes, there are signs that we see, but so what? Uh, it's, and it's mainly among the youth. And the youth need to have their fling. They need to have their time. I was, you know, when I was in college, I, I, became, I was at one time the interior minister, minister of culture, you know, uh, personification of Bhutan's tradition, traditional values and culture. And uh, I still see, whenever I travel outside, I'm, I'm very Bhutanese, you know, very g and <laughs> And yet, and yet, when I was a young, young man uh, in college, I had hair down to my shoulders. <laughs> and I attended many important functions, cultural events in Bhutan in my genes, which I would never do now. So, you know, we need to go through these phases. And Bhutanese youth have a right to go through these phases. I think by being able to do so, I think they will become, in fact, stronger in terms of their belief and in terms of the, of the, the importance that they attach to their identity and their values. I can only say <laughs> thank you very much. Our time is up. And I must hand the floor over to Ken Schroeder. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much.